Well, welcome to Harvest this evening. Good to see everybody here. Let's all stand. And we're going to turn to a wonderful hymn, a very familiar hymn, so let's really sing it out. Hymn number 341, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story. Our Savior came from glory. Lift up your voice. You know this song. Hymn number 341. I heard an old, old story. Our Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning and his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. and power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory sing it now oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion verse 3 I heard about the mansion that he is built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing of there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me. Man, I'm so glad that you're here tonight. What a wonderful night to be in the Lord's house. It's good to have a couple of guests with us. It's good to have Maggie Lorenz with us. Um, this is uh, the sister of Grace Kuykendall. And if you remember Andrew and Ellie Smith, we're just visiting uh, another sister of Ellie Smith. And so um, it's good to have Maggie with us. It's good to have Olivia with us. Olivia was uh, here for a week uh, in the summertime when Brother Josh and Miss Grace first moved out. She was on the crew that helped and uh, even participated in our Harvest Homecoming Choir. Um, I remember she was up there singing, and so that was a, a blessing. And uh, they're both juniors at Heartland Baptist Bible College and just here for spring break, and we're excited about them being here um, just uh, this week. And make sure you say hi to them and make them feel welcome. I don't see any other guests, guests with us. I see, uh, I see Brother Chad. He's a guest on Wednesday night. He does come to church on Wednesday. He's just normally with the Navigators. Um, but it's good to have him with us tonight. Uh, Pastor Lance and the teens are running the children's program over there. The navigator workers uh, get the night off, and uh, they're in here, and so we're thankful for that. But Brother Chad, would you open us up in prayer, please?
Men, we're going to remain standing and sing another song, but parents, I didn't mean to alarm you when I said Pastor Lance and the teens are over there running the children's program. Miss Josie's also over there, so we're, we're okay, all right? All right, hymn number 273. I'm so happy, and here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. I'm so happy, and here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin, Jesus took the load and gave me peace within. Now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. Let's do that one more time, you're sounding grand. I'm so happy and here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I am singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin, Jesus took the load and gave me peace within. Now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. The windows of heaven are open. After we sing this, then we'll have a time of testimony. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. And there's joy, joy, joy in my heart when Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy tonight. We're going to do that one more time. And really sing it out. We're going to say joy, joy, joy. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling. To sing it now. And there's joy, joy, joy in my heart. Since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure wine. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. You may be seated. Man, thank you. you may be seated. We're going to have an opportunity to give a testimony tonight, and, and while you're thinking about how the Lord's been working and how you want to um, give praise to him this evening, I was just going to let you know, um, uh, be praying for Pastor Addison and Miss Kendra uh, they're on a, a much-needed and long-overdue getaway, just the two of them. And so the boys have been with us this week. So be praying for us this week, too. No, no, it's been wonderful. We've had a good time. We borrowed an air mattress from Pastor Lance last night so the boys could sleep on an air mattress, and it was losing air in the middle of the night. And Ray heard uh, Hudson kind of a little bit crying, and Ray comes ov over to me in bed and is like, Dad, I feel bad for Hudson. I said, why? It's like he fell off the mattress and, and, he's, and he's just sitting there crying. And I went in the room to check on him and, and he wasn't crying, but he was sitting up and he was asleep while he was sitting up um, next to the air mattress. And Trayson was on the other side of the air mattress. And so I said, hey, Hudson, get back up on the air mattress. And he stood up and jumped on the air mattress and launched Trayson off the air mattress on the other side. And uh, didn't phase Trayson, though. I mean, he, he woke up and was startled, and I just picked him up and put him back. And we, it was good. We were, we, were, we, were, uh, we were good to go. But uh, uh, Pastor Addison and Ms. Kendra are, are gone. They'll be coming back tomorrow, so we'll be praying for them and safe travels. And then uh, Brother, Brother Joan and Miss Leah and their kids are up at Grants Pass, and he's filling the pulpit tonight. And uh, Pastor Jarrett uh, wanted to fill the pulpit, so he's up there too. So I don't know if they're going to have two services or two messages. I'm not sure what's going on up there. But no, they wanted to. They had, Pastor Jarrett and Miss Crystal hadn't had the opportunity to see the new building yet. And I said, well, tonight would be a great night to go do that. And so uh, they're, uh, they're up there that, this tonight as, as well. I want to thank you all that came out for our special Easter push this past Saturday. I was knocking a street and... Um, you know those those little ring doorknobs, those doorbells. Those have cha kind of changed the game. You can talk to people without uh, you know them seeing. And I was walking up to a door, and I hadn't even gotten to the door. I hadn't left the material at the door, nothing like that. And I hear a voice on the uh, coming out of this little ring doorbell. It says, uh, "It's like You're, I'm, we're not I'm not interested in what you have. You can take it with you." Oh, and I just said, "Okay, I'm not. I won't leave it. I'm going to take it with me then." 
And he's like, now, wait a second. What is it? I was like, no, 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 you're not interested. So I'm just going to take it with me. And before I turned around and started to walk away, he came to the door and opened. He's like, wait a second, wait a second. And he stopped me, and he's like, what do you have? I was like, I've got an invitation to our church. And he's like, oh, you got me. <laughs> but he did take the invitation. He said he was working last Sunday, and he wasn't able to be here. But if you pray, and he might tell you, he said that if he's, he didn't have his work schedule for this week, but he said, if I'm off, I will be there on Easter Sunday. And so i um, certainly looking forward to that. And um, uh, I, I was just having a little bit of fun, and it, you know, the, the Lord uh, was able to do a little 180 in his, uh, in his heart. So uh, that's just a, just a good time. Does anybody have a testimony or a praise this evening? All right, right down here, John. Hold on, John. Brother Jim's going to give you a, a mic. Dangerous thing to give John a mic. <laughs> Go ahead. I just want to say that um, it's kind of hard to get used to the new leg. And, uh, and, uh, what are you thankful for? I'm thankful for the new leg that I got. Amen. Amen, John. We've been praying for you that you would adjust to it. For sure. Everybody keep praying for John, but he's thankful for his new leg. Anybody else have a testimony uh, this evening? All right. Little John gave one. Big John's going to give one now. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Brother Doyle. All right, Brother John. Yeah, I just want to say it's a, a blessing. Uh, my, uh, my boss is a Christian, and so uh, in the morning after we uh, cover what we're doing for the day, uh, he and I have been praying together, and it's been just a real blessing. Amen. And praise the Lord. It's wonderful when you, you work with people that will support your faith. That's a good thing. Anybody else have a testimony? Raise your hand nice and high. We'll get a mic to you. And uh, you, can, you can let us all know. Brother Jim's making his way, Brother Roger. So just one, one moment here. There you go. <laughs> Homeowners, you, you know, we have trouble. Things happen at the house. And uh, brings to mind here that lately, uh, if the devourer's in my house, because we, we discovered that underneath the house, uh, one of the water fittings was leaking for a very long time without us knowing it. And so we had that fixed. And then we saw our figure better have an inspection. And I found out how God protects. The guy said water must have been leaking for over a month. And it was very wet and muddy and soggy down there. And it but it wasn't shooting up to hit the floor. Right. It was shooting over to hit a, a pre-treated 4x4 four four as part of the grid to hold the floor up. And uh, he said, there's no mold, there's no damage. It'll dry out fine, everything will work out. And so, just how God took care of that. Sure. Yeah. It's amazing how he just, I mean, if that thing would have been shooting up to the floor for a month, who knows what kind of trouble I'd have. Yeah. And you think the devourer's in your house, and really God's protecting you sure. all the time. Amen. Man, you would have been walking through the kitchen one day and falling through the floor. That would have been uh, quite a sight to see. Well, praise the Lord for his protection. Who else has a testimony this evening? Just a praise, something that they're thankful for. And, okay, Brother Colton. Um, I just want to say I'm thankful for the uh, Tuesday morning men's Bible studies. Yeah. Uh, just how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all given in different perspectives. It's interesting hearing the men that come giving their perspectives on the same scripture we're all reading, but somebody sees it a completely different way potentially and gives you an insight that you didn't think about. And it's just a blessing seeing faithful men coming and just sharing what God lays on their heart and giving you things you never even thought about. Sure. It is a blessing. It's been great. We've just had the two, but uh, both of them have been a blessing, and we're looking forward to the next one as well. He threw me off. Uh, Brother Colton Mr. Riley normally sit over here in expecting corner right there uh, with uh, Miss Kendra and Miss Cassie and Miss Riley and even Miss Joanna normally sits over there in that general direction. So Miss Katie, look out. I mean, you're sitting in that section, so I'm just like, <laughs> no. All right. Who else has a t testimony or a praise this evening? D down here, Brother Doyle. Uh, Miss Cindy has one. Oh, he's running. Well, I have to make up for not being over here for three months. So anyway, just the incredible blessing of being part of the worship service last night and um, just being ever so thankful for my salvation and Christ's mm -hmm. sacrifice. And, and 
you say how when we sing, stop and, and think about what you're singing, and I think that the environment led to that to a greater degree last night. But anyway, just the sorrow and love mingled, flowing down. Yeah. I've just been really meditating, and it's just been uh, blessing my heart and keeping the focus of why we're celebrating yeah. Resurrection Sunday this Sunday. Anyway, so um, just, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you think about it, I know Resurrection Sunday is a Sunday, but, um, you know, about this time, on this day, about 2,000 years ago, Christ is hanging on the cross. Um, so, you, I mean, you just think about that, and it kind of puts it in perspective, yeah, for, for sure, so. All right, yes, ma'am. <laughs> it, it won't bite you, I promise. No. Anyway, um, the I'm sure most of us have heard about the Francis Scott Key Bridge yeah. falling, and that is just terrible. But it really hit home to me because our daughter, Pastor Paul and Kyla and the kids have been in Washington, D.C. and Maryland, and just flew home yesterday. So it just, I looked on the map to see where it was, and it's so close to where they were. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they were ever on that, but I just was so thankful for their safety yeah. getting home. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that was a tragedy during our prayer time. We'll have to remember those that were affected by that. It's a horrible tragedy. Um, anybody else have a testimony or a praise this evening? Oh, there's a hand. Brother Anthony. Yeah, the other day I got, we got a call from our property management. And they were telling me if it gets busy around there, they're just putting a new roof up on our on our mm. building. Mm. I've been praying for that for ages. Amen. So Very the good. owner's family is starting to fix things up around there. Oh, amen. That's good. Yeah. The Lord cares about our, our prayer requests for sure. Amen. Anybody else? Testimony, praise. Don't want to miss anybody. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, giving those testimonies. They're always a blessing. Brother Aston, why don't you come? Let's stand together. We're going to sing another song this evening. So let's stand together and be ready to sing. All right, hymn number 89, Mansion of the Hilltop. We'll sing a verse and a chorus. Go around, make everyone feel welcome. Hymn number 89, Mansion over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just the God is silver and a little gold but in that city where the ransom will shine I want to go on that silver line I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow I will feel welcome.
was over the hilltop in ever I land where we'll never grow and someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that our parents go as we head back to our seats We'll sing verse 2, though often tempted, tormented, and tested. Though often tempted, tormented, and tested, and like the prophet, my fill a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a man to my own. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got over the hilltop and at the right land where we'll never grow and someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that are very ask our ushers as they would to go ahead and make their way to the front and we'll uh, give of our tithes and offerings, missions and church planting offering this evening. If you haven't filled out your faith promise um, missions and church planting card, please make sure that you do so and uh, give that. It'd certainly be a big blessing for us to be able to budget for the year and know what we can do uh, extending our church planting and missions program. And then also, if you wanted to give toward the roof, um, uh, that's, uh, we're starting that project on Monday, Lord willing. And so um, uh, we uh, are asking the Lord to provide there. So uh, doing a special Easter offering for that. If you're able to give, that would be just tremendous. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Ask the Lord's blessing on our offering this evening. Our, our great God, we want to thank you again for your vast supply. And, and God, we're reminded um, time and time again that uh, no matter what our check register says or what our, our bank statement says or what we see online on our app with regard to um, resources and finances, the Lord, Lord you, you are the one that takes care of us. You are the one that provides for us. And, and God, we just want to thank you and praise you for it. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we give this evening to, Lord, give cheerfully and, uh, Lord, that we would um, give uh, liberally. And, Father, that uh, we would take that money that comes in and use it for your honor and glory to get the gospel out around our area and around the entire world. And, and Lord, we'll give you praise for, for what you do with it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Miss Katie, for the message and song. Let's take our Bibles and go to Psalm 118 this evening. Actually, let's start in Psalm 103. Go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. There are 31,102 verses in the Bible. And since it's an even number, there's no single verse that is the exact center of those verses. So it's two verses. And the verses that we find that are exactly in the center of the Bible is in Psalm 103. And there are 1, no, 15,550 verses before these two verses I'm going to read to you. And 15,550 verses after. There's absolutely zero spiritual significance to this. Um, but if it ever is on jeopardy, you'll have the right answer. Um, Psalm 103, verse 1 and 2 are the two verses that are the exact center of the Bible with regard to verse count. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Oh, what a great place to have. I mean, what great verses to have in the center, right? Um, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible, which means there is a single chapter in the Bible. And let's go over to Psalm 117, because there are 944 verses before and or chapters before Psalm 117, and that many chapters after Psalm 117. Again, no spiritual significance to it, but look what it says. We read the middle verses, focusing on praising God. And look at verse one, uh, chapter, uh, Psalm 117, the middle chapter. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. This was a psalm that we uh, preached through two weeks ago um, when uh, we were doing our psalm a week. And tonight, we find ourselves in Psalm 118. And really, it's, um, it's uh, a message about middles, I guess you could say. We read the middle verses. We met, read the middle chapter. Psalm 118 has often been called to or referred to the, as, as the heart of the Bible. Psalm 118, the heart of the Bible, because in the Hebrew and Greek text, when you look at the middle, it's closer to Psalm 118 than it would be Psalm 103 or Psalm 117. And so it's just fascinating because uh, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. I want to read just a few verses to us tonight. From Psalm 118, look what it says in verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 118, I, I was telling Brother Chad, just sitting down there, I said, I'm not sure what I'm preaching tonight, because I got like eight, eight messages from Psalm 118, and I'm just not, which, I'm just not sure which one I'm going to go with yet. Um, but I want to read the verses that are most familiar to us in this psalm, and just make some comments about those. So we read verse 1, very familiar. Look at verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? There's a verse that's encouraging. Verse 6. Now verse 8, because this has often been called the heart of the Bible. Because in, the, in uh, the original languages, in the Hebrew and Greek, this would actually, if you put those together, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the originals, this is closer to the middle. Look what it says in verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. I mean, talk about knocking it out of the park right in the heart, right? Look what it says in verse 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Look at verse 22. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to take a look at some of these verses tonight, but let's have a word of prayer and then you can be seated. Our Father, we want to just thank you and praise you for your loving kindness to us, for your forever mercy that endureth really to all generations forever. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be encouraged tonight. Again, as we think on this day, the day that we could set aside and say, if we were in that Passion Week, today is the day that you hung on the cross. And so, Father, I pray that you'd help our hearts to be filled with gratitude. Because as Americans, we rejoice over the thousands that have died for our freedom, but we can only rejoice over one that's died for our soul. 
And so, Father, I pray that you'd help us to be eternally grateful for the sacrifice that you made so many years ago on a hill called Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I was reading an article earlier this week about a mega church um, pastored by a man named Stephen Furtick, who's well known and has written lots of books. And um, his church has come out and said that on Easter Sunday, they're not going to mention words like Calvary and blood and Golgotha and the cross because they want to make sure that whatever is said when so many visitors are here will attract them back. Um, that's just not us and that's not me because you, 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 cannot, you cannot hear the gospel to accept the gospel and receive it without hearing words like blood and Calvary and the crucifixion. And so that is what will be preached, not just this Sunday, but every service. And it just floors me that there are mega pastors in our country that make such foolish statements like that. It doesn't make any sense to me. And then I, I read a psalm like Psalm 118, and I'm reminded it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better. It's better. And so just by way of outline, let me give you an outline of, of Psalm 118 in its entirety. And, um, and Psalm 118 is a psalm that I, I would say is something that we need to do or as, what, what we need to express toward God for His forever mercy. Uh, we read about it in verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good because His mercy endureth forever. And so what should our, what should our expression be to a God whose mercy endureth forever. All right, so verses 1 through 4, here's the first part. Express thankfulness to God in every circumstance. Express gratefulness to God or thankfulness to God in every circumstance. It doesn't matter what circumstance you're in. Be, be thankful for it. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians said this. He said, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. But I have learned in whatsoever state I am, with, therewith to be content. Whether he is in the circumstance or in the situation of abounding, where everything's going well, or being abased, where everything's not going well. He has, he'd learned to be content. And we need to learn to express thankfulness to God in every circumstance. And that will help us get through those times of abasement. So express thankfulness, thankfulness to God in every circumstance, verses 1 through 4. And then the, the large section, verses 5 through 14, express trust in God through every crisis. Express trust in God through every crisis. I mean, you could read in verse number 5, I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and sent me in a large place. Uh, verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It doesn't matter what our government's doing right now. It's better to put trust in the Lord than to put confidence in those magistrates and those that uh, be in our government system. Why? Because we need to learn to express trust. Even through all of these difficulties, all these times of crisis that are expressed in verses 5 through 14, express trust in God through every crisis. And then, and we continue on and. Verses 15 through 21, we express total praise to God in every conquest. In every conquest. Verse 15 starts by saying, The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. Most Bible scholars believe that Psalm 118 was penned on the occasion of the completion of the wall and the gates when Nehemiah came back, when Artaxerxes sent them back. And now the temple's been rebuilt, the city's been rebuilt, the walls have been rebuilt, the gate has been hung. And now they're going into this psalm of praise here. And they say the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles. Well, now it's there again. It's in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. So in verses 1 through 4, we're supposed to express thankfulness to God in every circumstance even through the distresses that we read about. Express trust in God through every crisis. 
And we need to remember to express total praise to God in every conquest. It's easy to run to God and humbly bow before him when we are in the valley because we need his help and we need, we need to stay dependent on him. But oftentimes, what we do in the valley is not what we do on the mountaintop because everything's going well. What we do when we need help is not what we do when we're experiencing some, some conquest because we forget that it is God that got us there. And we just need to remember to express total praise to God in every conquest. And then in the last verses, verses 22 down to verse 29, I wrote this down, express testimony about God through every condition. Express testimony about God through every condition. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. So I wanted to give you a, a basic outline of the psalm. With my twist on it, of course, express testimony about God through every condition. But then I wanted to go back, and I just wanted to point some verses out to you. And then I want to end with some of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Let's go back to verse 1, because we talked about trusting in verses uh, really 5 through 14, but really the entire, the entire Bible, yes, is about trust. But Psalm 118 really can be wrapped up in the fact that, yes, we need to trust God. Look what it says in verse 1, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. And we hit on this a little bit already, so I'm just going to touch on it. His mercy is enduring forever. He is good. We give thanks unto the Lord. The psalmist leads with that. He closes with that. Look at verse 29. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. It's as if he was trying to get a point across. But it didn't matter, matter how many distresses he endured throughout the psalm. He began on the mountaintop and he ended on the mountaintop. Why? Because he kept God in proper perspective. And so when I look at verse 1, I'm reminded once again of this, and I mentioned it already, trust God on the mountaintop. You trusted him in the valley. He helped you climb the mountain, have that mountaintop experience. Why then on the mountaintop do we forget often that he's the one that got us there? And so we need to maintain that trust, that dependence on him, even on the mountaintop. And so trust God on the mountaintop. Look at verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Now, if this is on the occasion of the Jewish people coming back from captivity and they've rebuilt the temple and they've rebuilt the city and they've rebuilt the walls and they've hung the gates and now whoever the psalmist is whether it be a um, a leader of worship in the temple or Nehemiah himself they're they're still technically in captivity they're still technically ruled and dominated by another group of people so it's fascinating to me that in the midst of that, in the midst of that opposition, whoever penned this psalm under inspiration of the Holy Spirit says this, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? It's as if he's just witnessed a miracle. It's as if he just witnessed something that, that they cannot take responsibility for in the building of the temple and the rebuilding of the city and the rebuilding of the walls and the, and the hanging of the gates so that that city of Jerusalem was, was completed. And so, sure, why not? As a captive people, the Lord allowed us to do this. And if you remember in the book of Nehemiah, they have a trowel in one hat and a sword in the other. Because even while they're building the wall, opposition comes. And the Lord gives them the strength and the grace to fight off the opposition as they rebuild the walls. So it would make sense then that someone like Nehemiah or someone that was a first-hand witness to what happened when the walls were being, re being rebuilt and when the temple was being rebuilt, it would make sense then that they're able to say, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? I'm reminded in Romans 8 of the verse, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
when God is on our side, it's, it's, it's the majority. It doesn't matter. I love what uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer, when they were going up against the Philistines, and, and it was just them. And they were reminding each other that it's up to the Lord to save by many or by few. But they were going to do what they were supposed to do, and they had a great victory that day. And God often works through um, time and situations where the numbers don't often add up. I mean, we thought we had a mighty army with 32,000 men with Gideon. And God said, man, you've got a mighty army. In fact, it's too mighty. Send everybody that doesn't want to be here home. 22,000 men said, okay, I don't want to be here. I'm going home. 10,000, oh, that's still too many. Still too many. Take them down to that river and make them drink. And, and whoever drinks this way, keep them. And whoever drinks this way, send them home. 9,700 more. Go home. You know, if I'm Gideon, I was a little bothered by the 22,000 leaving, but I'm okay with 10,000. And God says, whittle down the army even a little bit more. And so I make them drink. And God says, okay, separate them. If they're drinking this way, put them over there. If they're drinking this way, put them over there. And there's 9,700 over here and 300 over here. And I'm thinking, okay, we could, 9,700 is not much different than 10,000. We're okay. And God says, no, you got the wrong group. Send the 9,700 home. You keep the 300. If I'm Gideon, I'm like, let me lay that fleece out again. You sure about this one, Lord? But throughout scripture, God's been doing a whole lot with the very little. The men's Bible study, we, we went through the feeding of the 5,000. What fun? Five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 men, not including their wives, not including their children. And because one little boy's mother thought to pack him a lunch. You talk about a firsthand experience there. And even the apostles who had seen Jesus heal the sick in his earthly ministry and do great miracles in his earthly ministry, doubted that, that Jesus, the Son of God, could feed the multitude. What is 200 penny worth of bread amongst so many? It's not, it's not enough to feed. Andrew, who I love in Scripture, is always bringing someone to Christ. Andrew, uh, when we see him, Andrew's bringing this lad to the Lord, and, and he says, uh, we've, got a, we've got a lad here, Lord, with a lunch. I didn't even alliterate that one. That just is the way it is in scripture. And, uh, and he's got five barley loaves and two small fishes. And I told the men on, on, on Tuesday, or one, this, day, this week's been running together. Yeah, Tuesday morning. I told the men, I was just like, you know, when I was reading that verse, and he says, he's got five barley loaves and two small fishes, I'm thinking, yes, stop. And then he says, but what are they among so many? And there's that doubt. But God's not interested in our addition. He's not interested in our multiplication or in our logic. If God wants to feed fifteen to 20,000 people with a little boy's lunch, he can do it. And if God wants to see a church planted in Grants Pass, he can do it. And if God wants to see a church planted in Idaho and Arkansas and Seattle and Eagle Point and Ashland, he can do it. Why? Because our, our, our thoughts about economy aren't his thoughts about economy. And I read verse 6, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Well, anytime God's involved, there's a majority there. So I wrote this down, trust God over much opposition. When nothing adds up, when everything seems to be working against you, you trust God against much opposition. And what a great verse for a time when when the Israeli people were back in Jerusalem and they just saw firsthand what God could do. Trust God over much opposition. And then verse 8, talk about a wonderful verse, the heart potentially of the Bible, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now I think every one of us, if I went down and just kind of singled us all out, we'd all say amen to that. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And while those words are good, I fear our actions betray us. Because who do we trust for our next meal? 
I'd like to say we trust the Lord, but man, if our paycheck for some, if, if the city went on strike or if the city said we're not paying any city employees, I think I dare say that we might get a little concerned. We don't worry, that's sin. But we get concerned. Or, or for some reason, uh, your, your, uh, your CEO or your boss sent out a mass email every, to everybody and said, hey, um, paychecks are going to be a week late. I, it was just a few months ago I was reading something that the average family in America is like two months away from bankruptcy. And that's with extending credit limits too. So like they don't have that much money. It's just that they have credit cards with limits on it that would allow them to survive for two months. Now they've got a whole bunch of debt and they have no money. So who are we really trusting for that next meal? Are we trusting the God of heaven or are we trusting the person that writes our paycheck? I mean, who are we trusting through that next trying time? Who are we trusting through that next news that the doctor's going to give us about something that's perceptionally bad. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we hope for bad news, but I will say this, no matter what news we hear down here from men or, or whatever it might be down, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So, this one's easy. I said, trust God on mountaintops. Trust God over much opposition. Can you guess this one? Trust God over, I wrote man, starts with an M. Yeah, trust God over man. And then verse 9, look at this one. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Now, it's interesting because, again, if the occasion of this is the completion of the city, Nehemiah had a good relationship with Artaxerxes. He was trusted by him. He was his cupbearer. He, Nehemiah appeared before the king with a sour countenance. It could have had him killed, but instead Artaxerxes didn't order his death. He said, what's wrong with you? The implication there is Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes cared and had concern for Nehemiah. And in our fleshly and worldly eyes, we would say that Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the ability to rebuild the wall. He gave him all the wood. He gave him the time off. He said, go and do it. If you need any help, just let me know. I love it when the, I love it when the Lord uses worldly, the world resources, you know, to, to pay, to fund what he's doing. And so we would fully expect if we were to just have a one-on-one -on -one sit down with Nehemiah and interview him. Nehemiah, do you trust Artaxerxes? He might say, you know what? I have a good relationship with Artaxerxes. He gave me leave to go build the wall and hang the gate. He gave us resources and supplies and asked if we need anything else to let him know. But it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So what do I write down about this? Trust God over the magistrates. Oh, man, isn't that encouraging to us right now? I dare say that at least on a national level and even on a, on a state level, we have magistrates in place. We have government officials in place that I, I'm just, I mean, maybe I'm stretching, but it would appear they don't have a whole lot of concern for the things of the Lord. Well, I'm glad I don't have to trust them. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So trust God over magistrates. And all that brings me to the verses of the day. Literally. Remember the chorus that's been sung? This is the day, and then you repeat it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. And we, we grab that verse and we apply it to several different situations. Maybe we're having a rough day and somebody wants to be an encouragement to us and they say, I, I walk into the office and I walk by Brother Chad's office and I can just feel the gloom because he's having a bad day as he preps for ordination. And I look in there and I utter words of encouragement and they go like this. This is the day that the Lord hath made. 
I will rejoice and be glad in it. And he says, yeah, all right, you got my shoes. <laughs> and we utter those words of encouragement to each other. We see it hanging in houses, written on chalkboards. Because every day, yes, is a day that the Lord hath made. And we should rejoice and be glad in every single day that he's given us to live here on this earth to serve him. But, let's look at this verse. In order to understand verse 24, you've you got to go back and establish its context. Psalm 118 is the last of those Hallel Yah Psalms, praise ye the Lord Psalms. From Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, and this is the last one. It's not necessarily the last in the book of Psalms, but it's the last in that, in that collection right there. Psalm 118 is also characterized as a, get this, a messianic psalm. A psalm with direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah that would come. All right, so make sure you can get back to Psalm 118 and take your Bible and go over to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John have been arrested. If you remember, in Acts chapter 3, they come across a lame man sitting at the gate beautiful. And he's asking them for money. And they say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of, Na in the name of, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible says he went walking and leaping and praising God. And he's not supposed to be walking and leaping and praising God because he's lame. And so when people see him doing that, they say, how are you doing that? Oh, I met these guys. And they're over there and they're by the temple. And so people that didn't like the fact that this man who was lame is now walking and leaping and praising God go over there to where he pointed them to about two guys that were talking to him and, and they're preaching. And they don't like what they're preaching, and so they arrest them. And so now in Acts chapter 4, they're standing in front of this council. And Peter, John's with him. But Peter stands up in front of this council, and they tell him, this council tells him that you're not to preach about this name anymore. We don't want you to do that. And so he's in front of this council and he starts defending himself and he says this, look at this in verse, eight, uh, verse 10 of Acts 4. Listen to this now, verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. <laughs> That's pretty direct. Remember, he's, he's on trial. He's talking to the guys that want him at the very least beaten and thrown into prison, possibly even killed. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. These are, these are the guys that tried to get the witnesses to lie about what happened to the body of Jesus. Hey, just say that his disciples came by night and stole his body. They paid them to do it. But God raised him from the dead, even by him. Does this, not, the, 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 doth this man stand here before you whole? Who? The, the lame man at the gate beautiful. You want to know how he was walking and leaping and praising God? It's because of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, who God raised from the dead. That's how, he's, that's, how, that's how he's doing it. And then look at verse 11. Speaking about this Jesus Christ of Nazareth, listen to this. This is the stone. What? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. What name? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God, whom God raised from the dead. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby ye must be saved. All right, so remember that. Go back to Psalm 118. Now look at verse 21. 
I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. Look at this now. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Now, I wonder where Peter got that from. Now watch what happens in verse 23. Remember, verse 22 is a direct reference to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. So we're talking about the crucifixion day of Jesus Christ right now. Look at verse 23. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, we can make application of that verse all over the place. In fact, we used it for our 40th anniversary video for, for this miracle right here. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes and is a very good application of that verse. But do you know what the interpretation of that verse is? Jesus Christ being crucified. This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Why? Because it's the only way any one of us can have pardon from our sin. And when Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross, it's the Lord's doing. And because he's hanging on the cross, and because he shed his blood to pay the penalty for our, our sin, it's marvelous in our eyes. We're the recipients and the benefits of the great blessing of the cross of Calvary. The stone which the builders refused, the one that they rejected, has become the head stone of the corner. And it's a direct reference to his crucifixion. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. So when the psalmist says, this is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. It's not talking about just having a good day. It's talking about the day that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross for our sins. Amen. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, it wasn't a day of rejoicing when it happened, but we have the privilege of hindsight. And so we look back to the cross and we know the end and we know what happened. And so we can rejoice. But the truth of the matter is we had enough knowledge to know, even the apostles, that they could have been rejoicing on that same day. But nobody got it. Satan did a little happy dance when Jesus died on the cross. For knowing as much as he did about the Bible, he should have been doing everything to stop that. But he didn't. The apostles were trying to stop it. They should have been doing everything they could to let it go. Exactly what Jesus told them to do. Remember Peter? Cut off Malchus's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when they betrayed, when Judas Iscariot betrayed him, betrayed Jesus. They're trying to stop it. Jesus said, put your sword away. It's time, Peter. There's no fighting this. So God the Father ordained, it is time for me to drink the cup of all the sin and the sorrow of the world and to willingly shed my blood and lay down my life so that, so that everybody's sin could potentially be pardoned if they simply put their trust in what I'd done for them. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, this verse is suddenly pretty convicting. Why? Because when I'm having a bad day, I have a hard time rejoicing in that day. And God the Father said, on the bad day of all bad days from the world's eyes, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And if that's the testimony of the day that Jesus Christ hung on the cross, then I have no idea what it feels like to go through a bad day. So yeah, I can make application. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah, and so I can trust God on mountaintops. And I can trust him over much opposition. And I can trust him over man. And I can trust him over magistrates. And I can certainly trust him over any form of mistaken doctrine. But man, I can trust him. Because this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I can trust him for meaning and purpose because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. I have no earthly idea how people live life not knowing for sure they're on their way to heaven. I have no earthly idea how people live life not knowing and having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I, I picture my life without a relationship with Jesus, and it has no meaning, and it has no purpose. No wonder why we're so concerned about collecting toys on this earth if we have no meaning, no purpose with regard to Jesus and a relationship with him. Because that's all there is to it. A collection of stuff that is as easily dismantled and burned up as it was collected and stored up. And so I can trust God for meaning and for purpose. Why? Because according to not just John 3.16, not just the Romans Road, not just Acts 4.12, but according to Psalm 118, which many scholars would call the heart of the Bible. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because it's the day that secured our redemption. So look at verse 29. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I know it's Wednesday night, I know it's a Wednesday night crowd, but with no one looking around, I just want to ask you this question. I wonder if there might be someone here that just be honest with himself. I wonder if there's someone here that doesn't know for sure that if they died tonight, heaven would be their eternal home. We talked about the cross of Calvary and how Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins. He willingly died and was buried and rose again the third day, just like the Bible says. And that's a day that we can rejoice in. Why? Because it provided salvation for us. But is there someone here tonight that doesn't know for sure they're saved? They don't know for sure they're on their way to heaven? I'm not going to embarrass you or call you by name. But if there's someone here this evening like that, you're just not sure that if you die tonight, heaven would be your home. Would you raise your hand just high enough for me to see it? Then you can take it right back down. Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. Anybody like that here? All right, let me ask you a question then, believer. I wonder, as believers then, I wonder if sometimes we find ourselves complaining about the day that we're enduring, not recognizing that the day that was the most difficult to endure, almost 2,000 years, a little over 2,000 years ago, God the Father says this about that, that day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And I wonder if maybe there's some of us here that have just forgotten the awe of our salvation, the wonder of our salvation. Find ourselves murmuring and complaining, bickering, complaining about how hard a day we had. When that day by measuring that should be counted as the most difficult day in the history of the world, God the Father says we will rejoice and be glad in it. I wonder how many of us say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I need, I need a renewed vision of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross because I find myself guilty of complaining, murmuring. Would you pray for me? Thank you. I see those hands. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? I see those hands. You can put them down. Our Father, we're sitting here tonight and we're listening to the piano play a song called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Lord, may we never use, lose the, the wonder and amazement of what you did for us on that cross. Lord, it is not by mistake that on the day that you were crucified, about 2,000 years ago, we were preaching from Psalm 118 that speaks about that very day as a day that you had made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. God, only you can orchestrate that. So Father, help us to as believers, to never lose the wonder of our salvation, the amazement of our redemption. Lord, give us purpose and meaning in our pardon so we would tell others about how you gloriously saved us and they can also be partakers of it. And we give you glory for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. The altar is open tonight. Maybe you just need to spend a little time with the Lord. Maybe you just need to say, Lord, forgive me for complaining. Forgive me for murmuring. 
Maybe you just need to tell the Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for willingly going to the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. As the piano plays, won't you come? have opportunity to respond. And thank you so much for your attention tonight. If you join us by way of live stream, thank you for joining us. And, and please come and visit us. This Sunday would be a great Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. But thank you so much for joining us. Here in the auditorium, go ahead and be seated.